Entrepreneurial Edge is brought to you by Business Banking from FNB. Because small ideas can lead to big business. FNB, how can we help you? Hello and a warm welcome to another edition of the Entrepreneurial Edge, the show that highlights what it takes to make it as an entrepreneur. This week we have an award-winning entrepreneur with us, named as Sunday Times Business Leader of the Year and Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year, Adrian Gore, founder and CEO of Discovery Holdings, is our guest tonight. Adrian, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, you've been described <coughs> by some as tenacious, driven and even maybe a little obsessive. Do you think that these attributes are partly part of the reason why you're so successful today? Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I do think success is about uh, tenacity. I think you do, it to, you do have to have a very defined vision and goal and dream, and I think you have to drive to get there. And I think unless you have luck on your side, which I think is not a reliable partner, frankly, Unless you have luck on your side, my sense is that you do have to be tenacious and, and you, have to be, you have to be driven. Um, but I would, say, I would say that you have to have a passion for what you're doing. And if you really love something, it appears to others that you're obsessive, but internally you're doing what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? So in a sense, I think outside, I think those attributes are important. Internally, I think you need to be doing something you want to do. Is this the Adrian that's always been like this? Were you this Adrian as a young boy? I think I was. I think I was always a pretty driven individual. I think I always had a desire to make a difference. Um, I actually am not a, a classic kind of business person. You with me? I didn't trade, you know, sweets and chocolates at school. You know, I'm, I'm not that kind of classic entrepreneur, but I, I, did, I, I do think I had a sense of wanting to make an impact on the world from an early age. It was kind of inside me somehow. And, uh, and I had some really good fortune, I think, in the opportunities that emerged. Now, you didn't trade as a child, but you did work in your father's confectionery store. Is this where your first, maybe, memories of an entrepreneurial business comes from? Probably. I mean, my father was a wholesaler in, in, in cigarettes and sweets. I shouldn't say cigarettes, but in those days it was, it was kind of okay. Um, and I'm not sure if it was inspiring, but in a sense, I think my experience was always in a small business, watching him trade, watching him keep the books of the business, you know, understanding the... So I didn't really, ironically, have any sense of working in a corporate environment. That was my upbringing. Uh, and, I, you know, it, it, was, it was fun and I watched it. He had some t difficult times as well. But, yeah, I think, I think that is true. But it is, it is, it's not what you want to do with your life, though. No, I, th I think I, uh, I, was not, I was not in pursuit of building a business, a small business. I, I kind of always wanted to make a real impact at a system level in a way. And uh, when I had that, that's why I studied actuarial science. I felt that was a, a, you know, a really good training for how big financial systems work and how you could influence things. And, and I think that got me on a path of the belief that you can make a real difference from a, from a real institutional capability. If you could build something at scale, you could use it uh, to better society and to build a great business at the same time. And I, well, they all came together, you know. Collectively. Speak, speaking of institutions, after you studied, you went to work for the then established Liberty Life. And some would argue, you know, pretty cushy job, you could have worked your way up middle management, maybe ma be management one day, but that just wasn't enough for you. You left Liberty to eventually start up Discovery. Why make that leap of faith, so to speak? You know, at Liberty, Liberty was a great, in fact, it still is a great company to its credit. Um, I, um, I worked in a R&D area, it never felt like a big institution to me. In fact, it, it clearly it was, and it was remarkably successful, but I felt I made a difference. And I think great companies do that to people, no matter how big they are. Inside them, you don't feel like you're in a cushy job and you're gonna be there for 50 years. Internally, you should feel a sense of huge turmoil and competitive force, and, you know, and I had that. So it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't at all cushy, quite the opposite. It was very competitive, it was very driven, it was, it was a feeling we could change the world. It was a very good team. And in fact, a lot of the guys that work with me today are ex-Liberty guys who I worked with. So if anything, it was a taste of the world to come. It wasn't a, I didn't really see it as a choice. Do I take the kind of corporate cushy job? It was more of an evolution. I've seen what's been done here. What if I could build this myself in a way? You, you know what I'm saying? That, so it was almost an evolution from that. And I, I was privileged, I think, to work with really smart people um, kind of entrepreneurial experience with institutional power. And I think that, that mixture is what really inspired me. And I hope we're doing that for our guys today, where they feel anything's possible. You know, they're not in a big 
institution that's just moving from year to year, you know. That inspiration to then take the leap to start your own venture, where did that come from? I think throughout that time I was there for six years, I qualified as an actuary at Liberty and I worked there um, in that process. Um, being in a, in a kind of an R&D new business focus for uh, at that stage, it was always about building, you know. And really the next step was always about how could I do this in, in, you know, on my own. Um, I think the idea of starting an institution or business like an insurance company is quite a bizarre idea. You know, I was a lot younger, I was like mm -hmm. 25 or 26 when the idea started to, to manifest. But it isn't really an intuitive idea. And um, I, I came across a, a mate of mine who I studied with, we did actual exams together, we worked at RMB. And uh, he's, I, I was chatting to him about this idea of starting up a health insurer. We'd, we, we'd built a health insurance product at Liberty that was unbelievably successful. And just without going into the macro issues, the whole changing South Africa, the healthcare system, all the dynamics kind of pointed to a need for something more substantial than the old style medical aid scheme. Mm -hmm. And so we developed a product at Liberty that was incredibly successful. And I then from that felt, what if we built a specialist health insurer, you know, what if, you know, almost American style where its entire focus was in health, it was actually sound, it had a strong shareholder base, and that became the vision essentially of what I wanted to do. Uh, this friend of mine who worked at R&B, we studied together, said to me, you know, they have a dormant life insurance license which you need, why don't you talk to them about them backing you and using their license as part of the, as part of the deal. And uh, I then approached R&B, um, the, then R the, the then MD of R&B, which was Larry Dippenau, who mm -hmm. then became first round, still chairman of first round, I think. And after a few iterations of discussion, um, they put in the seed capital. And what formed, what, what became a very, very good personal relationship, a good business chemistry with them and with Larry particularly. And uh, that's where the initial capital came from. So the idea sort of iterated. You know, when you look back on it, it, it was kind of obvious. But um, it was a bizarre idea. Now you touched on capital. It's regarded as the Achilles heel for most startups. And um, some are not as lucky to have existing relationships. How did you, I, I think the initial loan was for 10 million rand. How did you initially use that money and utilize it to its full capacity? And then obviously give return in, on investment for your, your shareholders. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the 10 million, we got to 10 million because the, the, we, we felt the FSB, the regulator, would require 10 million of capital, seed capital for the license. So that's where the 10 million came from. In truth, I think we spent four of it. So we turned it around quickly. In two and a half, three years, the business was profitable. Um, so it was actually very light on capital. And uh, amazingly, which I'm very proud of, is the discovery never started with a kind of a business plan. You with me? It has the capital. I mean, it's very unnatural. I mean, that's my training, right? <laughs> but the truth is it never had a business plan. It wasn't in two years or this three years, how much capital? It was a kind of a view that we need 10 million of capital. and um, and the real business plan, if you read the initial document, was about the macro issues taking place in the environment, what this company would do, how it would feel. It was more of a, a kind of a much higher level of intellectual argument for the business case mm -hmm. than a business plan. There were no spreadsheets, no budgets, nothing, right? So it's interesting, I'm not sure it's a good example, maybe a bad <laughs> example, but I do believe great businesses start with, with a dream and a vision, and the financial prudence is embedded in that. I think if you set out to make money, I, I, I don't think, you, I'm not being critical, the guys have done re remarkably well and have changed the world that way. My view is that a great business has a kind of a social dream and that's how it started. So if you talk about return on capital, the truth is it's the amount of capital was almost, was almost by decree yeah. and the, the, the planning was more intellectual and, and values based than numerical based. Having said that we turned it around uh, in three years and the amount of capital that Discovery is needed, I think in total we've probably raised a billion to a billion and a half, I think, which is today worth 23, 24 billion. So the return on capital for the initial investors has been unbelievable. It's been remarkable. Which is great news. Mm. Now, apart from capital, the startup phase, did you also start in a dingy office somewhere with a, with a subpar assistant, maybe a couple of telephone lines? Where did Discovery start and how did it, gr it grow from that initial phase? Um, you know what, I, I, I've got to say uh, my story was quite lucky. I didn't have a difficult, it was hard work, let me, not, let me, be, let me be fair. Um, but in truth, I raised a lot of capital for a startup, a lot of an insurance company that's small amount, but there's a lot of capital. I rented an office at R&B at the time. Um, and what we did, which I think was really good advice, uh, was we set up an executive committee which is bizarre. So you had an exco from the start? Yeah, there were no, ex there were no executives but me. Right? <laughs> but 
The, the issue is we, we brought in a few senior people from RMB, from uh, one of the German reinsurers, and essentially what it let me do was kind of tap into really experienced good thinking. You know what I'm saying? So from the start, the business had a, a feeling of, of an institutional scale. You know, and I think Discovery has represented the best of fleet-footed entrepreneurship, but with solid macro thinking and governance. And from the first meeting, that's how we started. I did have a small little office, I had a phone line, and I still have in my study today on the wall. I, I'm a keeper of lists to do, uh, you know, the to-do list from day one, and I mean, it's bizarre. Think of a name, think of a product. <laughs> I mean, the most ridiculous things. So it, it, it did have those roots of a complete startup and all the stuff of hiring office space and getting your first secretary and, you know what I mean? But I, I kind of didn't get bogged down in the, in the, what's the word? The glory, yeah, the glory yeah. of that, I actually never have. I, I'm, I'm very careful not to get bogged down in, in infrastructural hubris. Are you with me? Yeah. It's bad for the soul. That's <laughs> my, you know what I'm saying? You get caught in those things. You need to just keep moving ahead. So the answer is yes, it was, a, it was a, a dingy little office to an extent. But I think the aspirations are always high from the start. And the governance and structure was high. So I never really felt, you know, I'm in a little room somewhere. It felt from day one, this is the center of the world, you know. And Discovery was launched in a time where the medical insurance industry was, you know, quite solid but boring in a sense. There was no innovation. That said, when you had the capital and now you have the office, how did you win over consumers? Um, I think what Discovery did, and I hope this doesn't sound um, self-indulgent, I think what Discovery did well was we actually made profound change. Mm -hmm. you with me? We didn't come with some scam that... I have to be a hard seller to do it. We, we spent a lot of time on the product development cycle and uh, initially came up with the concept of a medical savings account. It was the first, it was kind of the first really institutional play. There were cottage industry ideas of that going on, but there was a lot of economic theory about kind of empowering the demand side of the healthcare system. If people feel it's their own money, they behave differently. And you know, it, it was a very profound idea, right, that um, we kind of baked into the product. and. Uh, to an extent, I think I'm a great believer you've got to change the rules of the game. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't start a business and play by someone else's rules. Well, I mean, first you're going to get killed, that's number one. <laughs> but number two, what value are you adding to society? You know, you're here to make a change and to, to progress things. So, so the product was different. Every single issue is different. We use brokers to sell medical aid in a sense, which they never did before. They sell top up health insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, the marketing is different. The, even the presentations, in other words, our, our competitors would have these, in my, when I started out, uh, they used to have these overhead slides. Remember those days? I think it's sitting for your whole time. <laughs> they used to have those transparencies that put on, you know what I mean, with a pen. I remember know. those from school. I can remember <laughs> that kind of stuff. I came with the first light show, you know, yeah. which is now like PowerPoint, whatever. But, so even that was different. But the real issue was, I think, the profound content. The issue was medical schemes in those days were not sustainable. Yeah. And our view was that if you changed incentives, you looked at the health economics of it, and you empowered people, they behaved differently. And when you got that right, costs would come under control. And we developed a very strong pitch to, to the CFO the, or the benefits people in the company about why you are currently on the opposite side of the fence to your employees. You're trying to keep costs down. They're actually out there, you know, being wasteful in a way. How do you kind of align incentives, you know? And uh, it took a long time, I'll tell you. For the first year, I was on the road with, with this little pack. You know, I, I know every street in KZN, you know, in the back streets of Peter Merritt's, but I, I've done it all, right? And uh, it was hard going, and we got to, I remember, 1,800 members. And for some reason, we just never got past there. I <laughs> don't know why, we kept putting on business, we never got past there. But once we figured out, once the message, things take time to, which it does take time, any new idea, once we figured out how to get it through, it started to roll. And, uh, and that, I mean, that was the starting point. And once you start to roll, it starts to roll. Things you know, from yeah, there. Yeah, they there. But I, I do think, I'm sorry I'm being long-winded here, I, I do think that, I think it was good marketing, there was good salesmanship, but in truth, I think the value offering was unique and profound. I don't think you build a, a sustainable business on nonsense, you know. Well, we'll continue with the discovery story right after this.